So hello and welcome to the New Gig Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Hodgson. And today I'm delighted to be joined by magazine editor, content creator and published author, Anton Brissinger. How are you doing, Anton? Very well, thank you. Good morning, Glenn. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, Anton, say a little bit about your background, um, upbringing, but also the very varied careers that you've got on the go at the moment. So, yeah, a bit of a trip. Um, my parents are fully Swedish. They moved to L.A. in the 80s, literally won the green card lottery and just never left. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in L.A. I went to Sigtuna, the boarding school outside of Stockholm. Yeah. From there, I lived in Brazil, worked in the favelas in Rio for yeah, several months, moved back home to L.A., and then I actually ended up working at the Weinstein Company for a little more than a year as an unpaid intern. But it was more of, I was basically a reader. So I'd read scripts every day. Yeah. And that's kind of where I developed. I always wanted to work in movies and stuff, but I found script reading very boring because it's all the same thing. Right. So you read kind of like 50 of just this very yeah, monotonous, very boring. And then started extra university. Uh, moved to Shanghai, China after graduation. COVID happened, moved back to LA, but I was very desperate to get back to Europe. So I moved to Malta from there to kind of work at a gambling studio, which okay. wow. was a, an experience in itself. Yeah. Um, li yeah. Lived in Malta. And then from there on, I got the book offer, which, yeah. And then I took that money, moved to London Ended up working at a startup up until last May where I was let go, but like 70 other people were let go too. So I think it was more just a sign yeah. of the company going in the shitter. Yeah. Um, got three months pay, which was nice. So kind of just had fun the whole summer. And now, yeah, I'm editor at Startups Magazine. So tell us a little bit about the life as a, uh, as a, as a magazine editor and also balancing that with the uh, the life of an author as well. Yeah, I think it, it's definitely interesting because I like, obviously, I I, I'm, I feel like I'm back in the track where I want to be. I'm not mm. some stuffy corporate guy. I can't do it. I just, I'm not my, I'm like legally retarded when it comes to anything that has to do with math and numbers and spreadsheets okay. and stuff. So being a magazine editor is definitely a lot more fun. I get to talk to people that I actually feel like I want to talk to, meet people I want to talk yeah. to. Um and yeah, so the author life, I mean, that's kind of still unfolding. So I don't really know how to answer that yet. But um, yeah, it's now, I will say, so the other day I was in a Waterstones in Piccadilly and I saw three copies of my book kind of just laying there in front of me. That, that was <laughs> probably the most surreal thing I've seen thus far in my life. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, should have done an impromptu book signing there as well, or, you know, a bit of, t bit of touting in the store. This is, you know, do you, do you know who this uh, author is? good stuff uh, you know I, I actually i went up to this was so douchey but i couldn't help it i went up to there was a mom and her the mom was older and the daughter was also they were both older than me yeah and i they were just kind of going out picking books and I, I was listening to them saying like oh but your cousin has this one. Oh, he likes this and finally i went up to them i was like look i don't want to be creepy or weird but <laughs> if i buy this for you will you give it to someone <laughs> for christmas and they're like why i'm like it's my book and they were actually really excited. They're like, oh, my God, really? And I'm like, yeah, it's brand new. I published it a couple of weeks, months ago. I'll yeah. sign it for you. They're like, okay, great. So I signed one of them for them. Was, they were very sweet about it. I felt like a total creep and this total kind of, you know, self-congratulatory douchebag. But, oh, well, you, you got to start somewhere. You, you, you definitely do. And uh, I think when my copy arrives, I'll be certainly uh, uh, asking for the for the same treatment as a si signing on the inside cover, please, Anton. That can definitely be arranged. I think it's fine. So I, like I said, I went to boarding school at Sigtuna, and yeah, the book is fictional. So you know, a lot of it is made up, but part 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 of it takes place in a boarding school, and I think. The first thing I've heard from all my Swedish friends is everyone bought the book just to go see how accurate I was in depicting okay. that experience. I love boarding school. It was a great time, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it definitely has its darker sides too. So I try to be accurate on both fronts. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, I will make my take some getting used to like most things in life, but a great title yeah. for, uh, for, for, for a novel. And she'll certainly put the, uh, 
the the links to uh, where you can uh, pick that up, certainly on sort of the Amazon US and UK sites uh, there and other good bookshops. But I'm really interested about how you've, you know, a bit more about your journey. How do you turn your kind of passion into a, a career, something that sort of brings you money and brings you sort of fulfillment as well, Anton? What's the kind of stages you've gone through? Or is that, it's probably a work in progress. Um, but just a few, a few of the the, the, uh, the the hurdles and things that you've learned along the way would be interesting to share. I think so. I always wanted to. I started writing. This sounds so like you know pretentious, but I started writing scripts from a very young age, probably like in short stories and stuff when I was yeah. like 13, 14, 15. Um, so that was always kind of the goal. And then I lived in, but I didn't really know what to write about or like per se what story. I I can never shut up. So I guess that worked in my favor. I just kind of translate <laughs> that to the page. Yeah. Um, when I was living in Brazil, I got robbed at gunpoint by like a 10 year old. Oh, wow. And I went back to the the place I was staying at. And, you know, you're clearly quite frazzled. And mm. I didn't have a computer with me, which I deliberately chose not to I didn't even have a phone. But mm. they had this really kind of crappy Windows 98 set up there. So I just started writing it out as a screenplay. Then I when I started work at the Weinstein company, I gave it to my boss and he was nice about it. He was like, yeah, it's all right. It's yeah. not, it's not great, but it's fine for being 19 years old. Yeah. And then my mom told me to try to write it as a book. And that seemed so daunting because books are, you know, they're long scripts are, you know, the 90 yeah. pages at most, most of the time. Um, and it just kind of made sense, I guess. But I mean, with that said, I finished writing it when I was like 21 mm. and now I'm 28. So it's taken some time for it to get published. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very, I don't know. It's a, I think it's just one of those things as well. I'm, I'm very, I'm quite an angry person, if I'm going to be honest. Really? Uh, in, what, in what way? Outwardly angry or kind of passive aggressive? How, how does it manifest no, itself? No, I, I, I take great pride in not being passive aggressive. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a little bit too honest when it comes to what pisses me off, but okay. I think basically I'm not to relate myself to the sex pistols at all, but Johnny Rotten's biography was called Stay Angry. Okay. And I saw that. I was like, fuck yeah, dude. Like I, I, I get that. That's, I totally understand. I don't know. Just, yeah. I think, I think that's the secret to any real passion with anything. You have to be angry at something either not existing and then you have to create said thing, which is lacking or just kind of expressing yourself in some kind of, whether it be intellectual rage, creative rage, some form of rage. Mm. I think that's when people create the best stuff. Cause if you're happy, I feel like then I'm just happy Then I'm just, I'm not thinking, I'm just, I'm in a good mood. I'm not really, you know, if, if, if you're having a good day, you're not really thinking about other stuff other than just kind of enjoying the moment you're in. But if you're angry, right. you almost kind of like, you need an escape for that anger. You need to find a vessel and whether that be in a song and a dance and a, you, you yeah. a boxing match in a book, whatever. Mm. Um, and I think, it's like uh, the uh, not that I'm a huge fan of the Marvel movies, but in the Avengers, when they ask the Hulk, they're like, don't you need to get angry to turn into the Hulk? And he goes, that's a secret. I'm always angry. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I feel that. <laughs> well, so it's probably a way of just heightening the sentiment, the passion and set up, I think, is probably the, uh, the, the in touch with these things that if it's kind of bland, vanilla emotions, there's probably nothing sort of good or uh, uh, special that's going to come out of that. You need the sort of the, the you need the kick, someone lighting a fire either in a good way or a bad way uh, to basically get the reaction to, to, to create, perhaps. Uh, absolutely. I think that and. Like, I feel like such a loser quoting all these very like, you know, famous authors and rock stars and stuff. But Scott Go Fitzgerald, ahead, I know that when he he was going to be drafted for the war, World War One, mm. and he wrote his first book with like an extreme sense of urgency and alarm because he pretty much thought he was like, hey, look, if I get killed on the battlefront, at least I need to have this just finished. And then mm. he said a famous quote, he said afterwards, said every author should write a book as if they'd be decapitated the day it was finished. And I think there's some truth to that. It's mm. very dark and almost, I guess, a bit cynical way of looking at it. But I think the whole thing of really just, I think in today's day and age, there's no real sense of urgency. There's mm. no sense of, I, I read a thing someone said that was very smart. Someone said, uh, tough men create soft times, soft times create soft men. 
<laughs> soft men create tough times. Tough times create tough men. Yes. You know what I mean? True. Yeah. And I think yeah. in today's day and age, we're li- living in this very cradled soft time. And it's very, you know, obvious and it shows in everything we do. And it, it, it bums me. It makes me angry. I'm like, fuck this. Mm. I just, I, mm. I feel like I'm in a constant state of just discontent, just listening to people. And then also, again, living in Brazil, it really puts some perspective on stuff. Absolutely. I didn't have running. Imagine. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Have, I didn't have. I, did, I didn't have running water for weeks at a time. I didn't have electricity. I mean, it's Brazil, so it's warm. But I mean, you mm. know, I didn't have electricity for weeks at a time. I would shower naked on the roof with a bar of soap when it rained. Yeah, um, and it, but it was nice. Genuinely, mm. I I didn't hate it. I genuinely, it it was all right. I got a very felt closer to myself than I had in a while, and it was very like little things. I remember there was a, they had this kind of they they had supermarkets. So it wasn't like this complete, like deserted wasteland, but yeah, I lived atop this very kind of spirally hill mm. and it was probably like a 20, 30 minute walk to get to the bottom of like where the kind of, yeah, I guess where the, the civilization was. Yeah. And so they had these people that kind of, you know, instilled this sense of community up there. So they had a guy who they called beer man. That was <laughs> the guy who walked around with literally a cart of beer. They had cake lady she baked cakes and you sold cakes from her living room. Right. And that was kind of how people like that existed. Yeah. And I thought, so when I was there, I got a much heightened sense of appreciation for like, I had a banana today and it was pretty good. Like, yeah. yeah so wow. I, I just, I, I ate a banana. I had two bananas. Wow. Look at me <laughs> living the dream. You know what I mean? It really. And then I came back to LA and Malibu and I was like, Oh God, I'm such a loser. Like I'm complaining that my Amazon package hasn't arrived on time. <laughs> well, Malibu, yeah, but down downtown uh, LA these days and uh, the favelas of Brazil probably very similar now. So uh, they, they do. You they have to go so far. I- they look identical. Honestly, it, it's yeah. heartbreaking. LA, genuinely. Have you have, you've been? We spoke about this. Have you been to LA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. LA. I mean, downtown LA, Skid Row. It looks like Brazil. They call it tent city. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know these things as well. I mean, it's, it's terrible. But at the same time, we've got this kind of, as you say, uh, uh, tough times, tough people, but uh, soft yeah. times. And, you know, if you're not tested, if the worst thing that happens to you is the, that your Amazon package comes late, then if that's the worst thing that's happened to you, it's the worst thing that happened to you. You know, you've got nothing to to get that sense of perspective, I guess, Anton. Absolutely. I think that, and I, I I've noticed... I think also what I try to capture in my book to some degree, because the one thing that I will give sympathy to kids in Malibu is that, yeah, you know, a lot of them, I mean, some of them have private jets and many of them, Okay. but wow. they have a complete lack of parental, not just guidance, but kind of love and affection. Mm. And that creates soft men in certain areas, but very tough men in other areas. Mm. So I noticed like when, again, boarding school in Sweden, it's funny because Sweden also sweet, unless you're like Ikea or H&M or Spotify, Sweden doesn't have that level of wealth. You know what yeah. I mean? It just, it, it doesn't really exist in the same way. It certainly um, doesn't. The tax man takes everything before you get anywhere near that. So yeah, there's no chance. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think I've noticed in Sweden, there's very much people, rich people focus on different stuff, depending on where you are. So in LA, rich kids are very jaded because it's like who if you have a rolex well i have a plane so that yeah, doesn't yeah. really you know what i mean there, there's a there's a different level of yeah lack of being impressed i noticed like when my sig tuna friends came to la because sweden with yam the login as i'm sure how long have you lived in sweden now it's been uh, 11 years now yeah so 11 I, I know, years the login this idea right? of everyone should be the same and equality which is ingrained to everyone you can't show off or be seen to have more or be better than anyone else exactly and it's just this kind of like communistic way of thinking but obviously it doesn't work because nobody really wants to abide by these you know unwritten <laughs> rules so they'll no. kind of incrementally you know step outside of this rules for example i got a rolex uh-huh but still you still it's still kind of yeah but you kind of got the same one that i got or i got a new <laughs> suit yeah but i kind of have the same one that you have and I noticed when my friends from Sweden came to visit me in Malibu, they were almost, it was a very, they, I don't, they'd never seen, because well, these are kids from Yusholm and, you know, from Estemalm. So very well. So very nice kids. areas of uh, of Sweden. Yeah. Top areas uh, in Stockholm. Be- yeah. 
Exactly, like the nicest areas in Stockholm. And yet then they came to Malibu and they would see houses for $80, $100 million. Yeah. And that those houses don't exist in Sweden. They literally do not they exist. Don't. So my friend, they would have like a borderline panic attack. It was very fascinating to see. They were so like, how does he make this much money? I don't know, <laughs> ask his dad. And it was <laughs> such a level of like, because it's seek to know, yeah, I got two Rolexes. Okay, that's nice. But yeah. then kids in Malibu, I have three airplanes and 14 houses. But also <laughs> the difference is in Malibu because they don't care about it and they don't show it off because it's not cool to show it off. It's not. So no. it, it, it was a very LA. That's the one thing I will give to LA kids over any other wealthy area I've been to in the world is that it's the only place where it's not cool to be rich. People okay. almost make an effort to come off as not rich. Almost act yeah. like, oh, no, I lived in a ghetto. It's like, dude, I've been in your house. You know <laughs> what I mean? You, you make the four seasons look like an outhouse. Um, so, yeah, sorry, a bit of a ramble there. But, yeah, it's just very – it's a, it's a very upside-down environment. I've noticed that my Swedish friends, when they come to visit, even me. Yeah. I'm, I'm Swedish by blood, but I'm born and raised in L.A., so me being in Sweden, I'm kind of this like, okay, I look Swedish, I speak Swedish, but I'm not Swedish. Right. There's no logom where I come from. It's very much, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hot sauce 24 seven. Yeah, me. definitely. Well, that's a real clash of nature versus nurture, I suppose, in these kind of ways. And I guess what you're talking about there as well, Anton, given that we have more digitalization uh, in society, um, whether it's sort of the workplace, whether it's sort of the the job market or just general uh, social interactions, this is kind of something that's uh, turbocharging a lot of these trends, I guess, as well. Absolutely, yeah, I think, yeah, the, yeah, it's it's, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know what to where to begin, but yeah, no, they're they're really there's such a vast, I think, just going on trends. I think also from like with adolescents, the one thing I spoke to my dad about this, and I'm sure. He's older than you, so I'm not trying to elude you to, but I'm saying that I've always just been curious of what it was like, just like going to a nightclub without a phone. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I've always wondered what that experience was like genuinely, because I feel like now China, man, that was a fucking nightmare. Like it was, I'm a very social guy and, and we'd every nightclub and I'm not a big nightclub guy regardless, but mm. I can admire architecture and stuff and the clubs in China, they're they look like something at a Blade Runner. It is so cool. And yet you're in there and everyone is just staring and no one's even dancing. There's like one guy on the dance floor. And so my friends and I, we were there, we'd go up and try to, you know, guys and girls like, hey, you want to get a drink? Want to dance? No, no. Just It's almost like you're the devil, like you're the enemy. And I was asked my dad hmm. what it was like to be at a club and just be there, like really being there. I'll never know. I'll never, yeah. even if I, if I don't bring my phone with me, everyone else is on their phone. So yeah. I can yeah. abstain, but that's not going to do shit for the overall experience. Maybe mm. for me mildly. And I've always been like, when we see photos of like, you know, Studio 54 and like these really cool nightclubs in New York and in London and Paris and in LA yeah. in the eighties and nineties, or just, I mean, anytime up until yeah the two thousands without cell phones, I've always just wondered what the experience was like. Mm. and how people just connected more and were much more present and there yep. wasn't this underlying feeling of like i need to show people what i'm doing right now because no mm. one gives a shit no one fucking cares that you're at it's, a club it, it's, We've it, all it's done too it. much it's too much for everyone it's kind of the 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 overload and i think it's also the fact that you're so past and present you, you, you make the good uh, distinction there as well. But I think the fact that now through this device in your hand or your pocket, you can access uh, uh, images from the 70s, 80s, as opposed uh, as well as now, you're always connected. Um, and basically, you can have this window into the lifestyle of, uh, of other people. So you talked about sort of Sigtuna and, uh, and, and, and Malibu. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was much more difficult to, to understand what that's like. Now you can look at two or three influencers and you've got a, you've got a, a blow by blow account of what it's like to have breakfast, travel around, go to the beach. Everything is there. Uh, and that sort of maybe fuels that aspirational element to it, but in a very negative way. Uh, absolutely. And I always, I always have great respect for my parents because I can't imagine what it was like coming from like borderline little communist Sweden in like the 70s and 80s where my parents told me that they got Scooby-Doo once a year on Christmas 
right. and that was like holy shit american television wow there was when my grandma was growing up in Stockholm, you had to buy garlic at the pharmacy. I mean, so it wasn't even that long ago. And so my parents getting on a plane and just moving to Los Angeles. I mean, huge step. And it, yeah. it just, it's like moving to the moon. It's like, yeah. a fucking what? Yeah. And I've asked them, I was like, what was that like? And my, I mean, they're, my parents are, you know, they're hip people. So they weren't some like nerdy weirdos, but still, I mean, and then I always, the biggest thing in going back to the book is i've always because i'm the oldest of five my mom right. has three my dad has five um wow. and i've always been so because again weed like marijuana in mm. sweden in the 80s was like saying you're shooting heroin with keith richards you know what i mean okay and then weed now is legal in california um and it's pretty much been legal <laughs> from day one you know what i mean everyone just smokes it all the time but I've always, I, the older I get, I have this real compassion for my parents, how they must look. Because I was a pretty wild kid, right. running into trouble, uh, I've been arrested, all that stuff. So I real have this kind of heightened sense of r r real just compassion for my dad coming from, you know, my dad, he went to Karolinska in Stockholm. Yep. Very, very book smart, worked very hard, all that stuff, never did any drugs, never did anything. And then he just raises his kids in Malibu, California. And what that must have been like. And, you know, I hated school. I hated everything. I hated all that stuff. I would do drugs with my friends. And it must have been so like, what is happening? How is this my child? And his mm. his siblings or his sibling, his brother, his kids were raised in Sweden. So they had a much more similar upbringing to what my dad had. And then, it, but it's like a double-edged sword because my dad's like, how are you doing all these things? I'm like, well, dude, you moved to Malibu. I can't. I don't know. This is my reality. This is all I know. I didn't grow up in Sweden like you did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, the, what would you say sort of the, the, the role of education is here? I mean, is it, is it the education system? Is it from your parents? Is it from the other media around that as well that sort of uh, allowing people to see what's uh, what, what's possible and you know particularly thinking about sort of jobs and careers as well Anton uh, how wh where does this come from where what forms your thoughts about what you want to do how you want to make money and uh, spend your days basically I think so the the biggest and this is good and bad um so funny story. So my, my whole life, we ate dinner together as a family. And yep. a lot of my LA friends, unfortunately, are very disenfranchised from their parents. Mm. But, you know, when you're 13, you just, you get away from your parents any opportunity you can. So I was just, you know, when I was at my parents, my friend's house, I was thrilled. I'm like, oh, great. We don't have to eat dinner with your family because that's what we have to do at my house. And I hated it. Okay. And my parents were very militant about having these family dinners. Then I moved to Sweden and I always thought I was a weirdo because my American friends would come over for dinner at my house. Yeah. We'd sit down as a family and I hated it. Then I came to Sweden my first year at Siktona and my first friend invited me over for dinner and I had dinner with his family. And I started crying because I was like, wow, I'm not a weirdo. I'm just Swedish. And it really kind of took me for a loop This because I was kind of, I was never and in LA. This, I'm born and raised there. I've never lived. I mean, now I have, but at the time I'd yeah. never lived anywhere else. But I was always a Swedish kid because I spoke Swedish with my family. Right. I was always a Swedish. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where your mom has an accent? Where are you from? Mm. Okay. And then in Sweden, I was always the American kid, even though I don't have an accent when I speak Swedish either. And I'm fucking blonde and my name's Anton, but still. So I was always trying to find this kind of finding my bearings. But I think where I grew up in LA as well, a lot of my friends' parents are artists. Okay. So it was a very surreal because you know, I would meet the artist when he'd made it guys, you know, famous actors and producers and whatever, mm. but you know, actors, when they're not filming a film, they're essentially out of a job. They just happen to have a lot of money. Yeah. So I would come home to my rich friend. Freelancers. It, very, <laughs> it, it really was. And it was, it, that's exactly, it's a good yeah. way to put it. Rich freelancers. Very good. I've never, that's, did you come up with that? That's good. I'm going to use that. You can, you can um, use it royalty free Anton. It's yours. Um, I'm going to use it. No, but it was very surreal because you'd come home and I'd see my friend's dads or moms who, you know, could be famous people, but just kind of hanging out, just just mm. waking up late, just chilling. Whereas my dad being a doctor, you'd have to wake up early every day for work. Yes. And I was, I feel like the only friend I knew whose dad had a nine to five, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. all my friends in Malibu, they were, I mean, what, even, even if it's something to become a lawyer or a doctor, 
that requires much, much, much harder work. And Malibu kids are kind of like, well, look at my dad. He's chilling. I'm like, well, yeah, you didn't see his struggle though 30 years ago because you weren't alive. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that, and it kind of, it can fuck kids up because they're like, oh, well, my dad chills. Yeah. Now, because he's 60 and has a couple of Academy Awards. Now we can take it easy. And I will say that in that sense, I definitely give Sweden much, much, much higher praise and credit because in Sweden, it's not, again, that's what I noticed at Seek Tune. Because in LA, it's very like, yeah, I don't give a shit about school. Fuck school. I don't care. Right. And then in Sweden, I remember my friends were like, whoa, you got an F? How the, what? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because yeah, school sucks, right? High five. They were like, no, no. Yeah, that's no. not what a good thing. <laughs> and I got so, I got so embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, I have to study. What the, what? Yeah. And all, I don't have any Swedish friend who is like a burnout. Even like the richest of the rich ones. They're all working hard. They all care. Yep. Um, I think that's great. And I think that's a very good image to give to your children when they come. It's yep. an image to give. But my, my dad's favorite joke is the more north you go in Europe. So, you know, Scandinavia, Germany, uh, parts of Eng- England, I suppose. Food sucks. Weather sucks. People suck. But everything works. The more south you go, food's amazing. Weather's amazing. People are amazing. <laughs> nothing fucking works. <laughs> So it depends on what you value. And I think California, where I grew up, has a much more kind of Italian way of living and kind of yeah. floating through the world. It's kind of why should I get up early and work really hard when I could just have some wine and chill out and smoke a joint? <laughs> and that's just very – and Sweden has a much more of that kind of New Yorker mindset because it's cold. Yeah. You can't chill during the winter because you got to feed yourself. You know, you got to worry about food for tomorrow. You, you, you definitely do. And I think there's also that uh, – the, the mindset piece as well. And I think that the fact that it doesn't matter what you're going to do, if you're going to be a, a, a YouTuber or a doctor, a dentist, or a, a famous artist, the amount of graft you need to do, it's the, it's the dedication. It's the uh, getting up early, just basically being on it and, and really sort of chipping away every day. And I think that it doesn't matter what you do, there's no way around that. And this mentality that you can just get whatever you want instantly with no effort uh, it's never going to be anything that's going to be uh, 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 possible or really long term, even if you win the lottery, you know, it's going to bring on a whole host of problems as well on the back of that. You need to have that discipline to be able to work through these things and build things up over time. But it's uh, it's more tricky to be able to build that in, I suppose, at the moment, Anton. I think, yeah, I think it it is more... The saddest thing is, because again, I, I've always, uh, I'm, it's a double-edged sword because I've been very spoiled in the sense that I've always known what I've wanted to do. Yeah. And I have many friends who are approaching 30 and are still kind of like, well, you know, I could jump, I could try this job. And that, that must, you know, because I, despite the, you know, I've been, you know, even now, yeah, I'm a published author, but I probably got 200 rejection letters, if not more. Yeah. Um, constantly, yeah, it was, isn't for us. And I, but I, that's the kind of, I've accepted that. And I'm very, I'm, I'm happy to, Freud, I think it's either Freud or Carl Jung who has a quote and they said, um, in the future, the times of struggle will strike as the most beautiful. And I know <laughs> Louis CK, the comedian, he said, cause I mean, he, he didn't, I mean, he's been working in comedy, but he didn't like make it, make it, especially financially until his mid forties. Right. And he said, yeah. now he's probably mid fifties, I would imagine. And he said, he goes, I kind of miss the pain because now Mm. I feel like I'm not artistically as good anymore. And if you look at punk bands, look at rock and roll bands, who's good after 30? No one. (laughs) Because when you have, when you have money, same thing with fight athletes. I think it was, I think it was Sonny Liston or some boxer who said, it's hard to wake up at 5 a.m. and go running when you're waking up in silk sheets. Yeah. Marvin Hagler. Yeah. Yeah, Marvin Hagler. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Marvin Hagler. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. And they're so true. And I, and now it's a very, because it really is that feeling of like wolf at the door. But I think with today's adolescence as well, I think kids are seeing, not to name drop, but my my half sister, she's in school with Kardashian's daughter. Okay. Kanye West and Kim's daughter. Interesting. And this kid already has like a trillion, I don't have TikTok, but she has like a <laughs> trillion followers on TikTok and she's like 11. And even if, her par- even if her parents cut her off financially tomorrow, mm. this 11-year-old genuinely will probably be okay financially just because of her name yeah. and because of the kind of accessibility to brands that TikTok has provided her. And so my 11-year-old sister, 
her aspirations are to be a fucking TikToker. And that literally makes me nauseous and anxious to my core. And my dad, it's funny because when I was growing up, I was like, oh, I want to be this artist. And he was like, oh, you have to go to school and whatever. Mm. Now he has a kid whose goal is to be a TikToker. So, mm, you know what I mean? <laughs> Well, that's the thing, but you know, she may have all those followers now, 11, but you show me one child star or famous person who gets all these uh, uh, things early, who by the time they're 30 is not completely messed up. I can count on one hand how many people that there are. So, uh, you know, what the Lord gives with one hand takes away with the other. So I think there's a, it, it's a, a, a huge minefield there, Anton. There, there is, and there's so many. I know that there are a lot of Stockholm girls that I either went to school with or that I met friends of friends. Right. And they've become influencers now because they, and Sweden is very much kind of like a, for good and for better and for worse, but it's very much kind of like a, a wildfire society. Kind of one thing catches on everything, catches on everyone. Completely. And yeah. Swedish girls are known for being very pretty, which they are. Mm. And, you know, I always made that joke. I'm like, no matter where you go, my dad said it, my dad's like every rock star in the world. Oh, I used to date a Swedish girl because they're ubiquitously known as being the prettiest women, which I won't disagree with. And I've lived in Brazil, all over the world, a very pretty, I mean, LA in Sweden still wins. But so I think Swedish girls now yeah, have seen, oh God, I'm pretty and guys will like me if I'm an influencer. And it's be kind of spreading this. So oh, I could just make money off that way. That's easy. Yeah, but again, yeah. I think it, it it's it's an easy paycheck now. But I think I could be wrong, and I sound so, you know, pseudo philosophical. But I I think it's very unnurturing for your soul, and I don't imagine being forty and pursuing something where you're promoting teeth whitener and blemish mm. powder or whatever the fuck Probably will be not. very fulfilling <laughs> as a career because I just don't. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm the asshole. Maybe I'm the asshole. Maybe I think I'm better than people because I want to write books and make movies. That's not it. But I just I genuinely I just don't see how in any universe one could be truly fulfilled to your core with yeah. promoting fake tan and teeth whitener <laughs> and toothbrush and hair vitamins. You know what I mean? <laughs> It probably not something that's going to be very fulfilling over more than a week or so, but uh, you know what I mean. It's just yeah, yeah. It's just and, and they all kind of they 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 kind of subscribe to the same. They got the same look now. You know what I mean. They call it the Instagram face. Completely. So they kind of like yeah. the the kind of the the yeah, it's taken after Kim. I just uh, I'm gonna go on a tangent for forever. I'll stop myself, but yeah, <laughs> very soul sucking to say the least. Well, well, it is. But Anton, it's great that you're holding up a mirror to reality and look forward to, you know, your, your, your great content, Startup Magazine, but also what this anger and this kind of reaction towards the way society is going, what's going to be the uh, uh, the fruits uh, of this in terms of the next novel as well, which I'm sure you've got several ideas on the go already and uh, look forward to following those through. Thank you so much for having me, Glenn. This has been my first podcast when I've been a guest, so I very much appreciate it and hope I'll speak to you soon. Absolutely. And do let me know when the books arrive. I'm very, very, <laughs> very eager to hear your thoughts. It, uh, you, you will definitely be the first one to know. Absolute pleasure, Anton. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Take care, Glenn. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas.